Okay, now it's time and my pleasure to in introduce Jane Wodening. Jane lived in Boulder Canyon from 1948 to 1957 and went to Boulder High. She moved to a suburb of Rollinsville, Lump Gulch, in 1964 and her kids went to Netherlands schools through high school. She lived in Lump Gulch for 23 years. Jane spent one year, 1989, in Netherland, moved to 4th of July Canyon in 1990, and lived there until 2004 when she moved to Denver. She's written Lump Gulch Tales, Mountain Woman Tales, Drive About, Living Up There, Paper and Audio, Wolf Dictionary, Animals I've Neglected to Mention, and a few others. Please help me in welcoming Jane. <coughs> occurred to me to become a writer. For heaven's sake, I couldn't even speak. I, it wasn't that I had a speech problem. It wasn't that I didn't have a vocabulary. It was just that <coughs> when people would be talking about something, I'd want to join in, but I'd have to think how to put my thoughts together. And uh, really, that's, that's the main reason I write because I'm a slow thinker, I guess. <laughs> um, I, I can hope that it's like the meals of God, but anyway, that, that's my problem and, and, my, and my guide and my whip and everything. Uh, uh, I, so that, now, the, what I really wanted to do, always, not right, but, uh, to uh, be with animals. I always loved animals and, and I, I feel like I understand them and they understand me, obviously. They understand me uh, uh, and I try to understand them. And uh, uh, actually I got, I got uh, so involved with, with dogs. Dogs are, are available, or at least they used to be. Um, now you have to, find them on the end of a string and that's difficult, but uh, uh, I, um, I wanted finally to write a dog dictionary because then people would understand what their dogs are saying to them and, and they would understand <laughs> animals that they come across and, and uh, I, I didn't do it for many, many years. I finally wrote uh, the Wolf Dictionary, which was a very different thing from what I was thinking of at first. So sometimes it takes decades before a book comes out in the, in the right way. Um, I did want to mention the difference between I, I know that a lot of people want to be a writer. And um, uh, my feeling is that, that well, if you if you if you want that dream of being a writer, that's then then keep the dream. If you want to write, that's another thing entirely. Writing is is something that you do because you need to, or because you have something to say, or. Uh, actually, people like uh, Isaac Asimov and Agatha Christie, I think they were, they just had to write. Uh, they just couldn't stop. Was, uh, but, uh, so that, um, boy, my eyes are good, bad, I can't, oh yeah, so, well, um, yeah, I, I did, I always read a lot, and I read a lot of animal stories again, and, and uh, so I've written maybe half of my stories have been animal stories, um, and, uh, and a lot about people too, and other things like adventures. Uh, I, I, um, 
I was so frustrated about about the dog dictionary that I was having a conversation with my friend Barbara, who she said, well, she wanted to write too. She wanted to write poetry, and I wanted to write a dog dictionary, and uh, couldn't think how to do it, and she couldn't get it together to write poetry, and we swore. We, we made a vow, we, if either one of us writes anything, we would send it to the other. And uh, years went by, and uh, I was writing journals. I, I was writing my journals, I'd write like, oh gosh, I saw a raven today, and, and he said, <laughs> and that's, uh, <laughs> that's hard to spell, but... Uh, <laughs> My best. I would like to say about journals, journaling is, is a real, possibly a very good way of writing. It, 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 it can have suspense, it can have drama, it can have all kinds of things. And, and so don't scoff at journalism as I did. And then I didn't, I didn't send my bird journal to Barbara, which I should have done. But uh, then I heard that she was dying from her, her daughter told us, and that she wanted to see us, um, my, me, Stan, and the five children. So we all piled into her death, her, her bedroom, uh, circled around it and, and uh, around the bed, and there she was. And she had hardly any hair, and she had, she was very pale and very, one and all these things that looked like dying and and uh, I had told the children you know you just smile don't worry about that about what to say or do and but my husband he was he was magnificent he did a fabulous little uh, I don't know what it was a vignette of some sort and uh, and made her smile and then they all left because she was my special friend and I was speechless. I, I was really speechless. I couldn't say a word. And there she was. She, was she, had, she, had, she had bones. You know, she was one of these women that had bones. She was such beautiful shape of the bones of her face. And, and then she had these big, kindly eyes. So she was looking at me with these big, kindly eyes. And, and I was looking at her like, unable to speak. And, and she understood it all. She was, she was a wonderful person. She, she gestured, it's okay. It's all right. It's all right that I'm dying. It's all right that you don't speak. It's all okay. And, and you know that you and I have been friends. And I shouldn't, I shouldn't bring that up because it, I always burst into tears when I uh, say it, but anyway. So I went home and in the middle of the night I woke up and it was a hideous nightmare that my head on the pillow was her head on her pillow. And I realized that really for the first time that I was going to die someday, and uh, if I didn't write anything, I would uh, die without writing, and with and without having said the things that I have in my heart to say. And so I couldn't, of course, put my head back on the pillow. I uh, had to uh, get up and write, and I wrote about Barbara and about death and dying and about about gestures like that one that she made and uh, it took me about a week to write the book to write the story it was uh, and um, and I then I called up the next morning and her her daughter and uh, and said I, I would like to read this story to Barbara can I do that no she said she died last night yeah. she had she must have died just as I finished my story. That's my feeling anyway. But she had passed me the torch. 
And I realized this is the secret. You have to be passionate. And then the words flow. And so, um, well, after I'd written that story, I thought, well, I'm not going to stop now. I've got to do another. What should I do? And I thought, well, I'll do this, this story that I've told for 20 years. And here I am, without, without it in front of me, but I will tell it to you. And it's, I'll have to take this because it's a really one of these stories that you have to dance around a little bit. <laughs> so we were, we were, uh, we went to the zoo. My husband and I and and uh, and uh, the baby, uh, six months old. And my husband was holding the baby on his shoulder. And his, her little bare feet were sticking out. It was a hot day, so she just had her diaper on and panties, and, and that was it. And uh, we came to the orangutan cage, and the orangutan came running up to us, really, came right up to us and was looking at, that, at the baby's feet, <laughs> uh, kicking. And, Oh, she was like, oh, she was reaching and she was like, like, she had such, she had beautiful eyes, too, and, 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 and a glorious face full of expression, and, and, and her arms and her hands were wonderful, long fingers, and, and, uh, and I said to Stan, she wants to see the baby. It seemed clear to me. Uh, so, uh, so he took, took her off his shoulder and put, put her on the, on the railing there, and, and, and baby looked at, at the orangutan and, and uh, was kind of startled. But uh, the orangutan just was so, so excited. I mean, she wiggled her fingers at, and she was open, and she like curved her mouth into a ooh. Like uh, saying, "Oh, the little darling," and and uh, and uh, and then she reached her arms out way cl as close as she could to to the baby, and and I said to Stan, "When she wants to hold the baby," <laughs> <laughs> but he 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 didn't. Uh, <laughs> so, but you know. The orangutan was upset. The orangutan was upset. And I, I think now, as I think about this story, and, and again, I, I think I'm learning again, another one little item that I hadn't thought of before, and that is the, the next thing she did was she leaped about and beat her hands, leaped about beating her hands on the walls to make a loud bang and screeched, and, and, and then she came down and of course, the whole monkey house, all the people in the monkey house had gathered around behind us. There was, there was a crowd. She had gathered a crowd. And so she, she came up in front of us, and she slowly reached her hands down between her legs, and she pulled up an imaginary baby and looked at it fondly. And she did it again and again. She did it three times, and it was each time um, she gave each one the full, the full time. And, and uh, I, I think I've seen uh, like Native women dancing that move to say, "I need, I want to have a baby now." And uh, of course, she was saying that. It was clear to me. Uh, <laughs> But it probably wasn't clear to those other people because they hadn't seen what went before. Then she went and, and lay down on the on the on the on the, on the cement and uh, and flash, flash, thrashed her arms around and then she pushed like we do when the baby is just coming out, pushed with her abdomen. And then she got up and squatted and glowered and peed on the floor. And then she jumped 
from shelf to branch to shelf up up to the very top and and turned her back on us with her face to the wall. Thank you very much.